2014, there was a large influx of immigrants coming to the U.S. from Central America. Amongst them were hundreds of Garifuna women, of which a large number is currently living in the South Bronx. We visited La Iglesia Evangelica La Española and spoke to Lucy Pagoada of the Honduras USA Resistencia and some of the Garifuna women to get an update on their experiences. In Honduras, since the coup, we've been having a crisis of migration because the people cannot withstand the violence. What we saw was the cruelty and the inhumanity in which the Garifuna women were being received. When I first received a call from um, Reverend Danilo La Chapel from the church, and he was alarmed about what was happening with the women coming in with the electronic monitors and with their children. Some of the women were pregnant about to give birth. We, we learned of some women giving birth on the train, and on the beast. Cristal nació prematura de 32 semanas en el tren que transportaba a su mamá y a sus tres hermanitas desde Honduras. Debía nacer en agosto, pero se adelantó cerca de la frontera. Despite of the fact that these women and all these families meant to uh, Garifunas and non-Garifunas, because we also have to understand that this is the situation of the entire country. When they come here, the empire ruling a superpower of the United States decides that now we're going to treat them like criminals. We cannot speak about the, the incredible levels of violence that Honduras is undergoing today without referencing to the uh, direct influence that the United States has had in Honduras historically. If we go back to the 1950s with the implementation of the fur companies in Honduras that uh, practically took over a huge part of the land to plant bananas and as a result Honduras became like this huge platform of banana production and, the ens and, and that also involved the, the enslavement of the Honduran people to work in these companies in horrendous conditions to the point that in 1954 uh, Honduras had the first uprising of the workers. It was the first strike that was done in Honduras against a U.S. company, the United Fruit Company. And the workers were able to gain some benefits, among them the right to organize in unions, because of the type of corrupt governments that we've always had, that have been willing to give up our sovereignty and to sell out for nothing our land, our resources. In the 1980s, when the rest of Central America was leading the revolutions of liberation, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, Honduras became like the military platform of the United States. It was in 1982 when the United States established the largest military U.S. air base in Honduras. It's called Sotocano or Palmerola. That air base was the platform of the Contras, if you remember the, the biggest scandal of the Contras, to go and fight against the Sandinista revolution as well as the, uh, the Salvadorian FMLN revolution. That's not to say that in Honduras there, there, there wasn't a resistance. There has always been a resistance of the people, but we have always had to fight against the huge, violent U.S. Uh, military boot. In 2009, when the coup, when the oligarchy in Honduras, supported by the Honduran army, which is one of the most violent killing machines that we have in the country, along with the support of the U.S. ultra-right groups, uh, perpetrated the coup against President Zelaya. We saw the, the uprise of one of the most important movements of the people, the FNRP, El Frente Nacional de Resistencia Popular. And in that context, we all organized against what was happening to us because the country became completely militarized. We know that the United States was leading the coup. It was financed in the police and the army. We've had a history in, in, in Latin America, specifically in Honduras, of this continuous invasion, military occupation, and as a result, a society that has suffered the incredible violence that is perpetrated when a country becomes militarized. Son dos problemas que me hicieron tomar esa decisión de venirme porque estaba teniendo muchos problemas ya de violencia doméstica y ya eran demasiados enfrentamientos que hacía la, la pandilla y ya me estaban exigiendo pagar el impuesto de guerra y en, en un abrir y cerrar de ojos yo tuve que abandonar todo y salir de mi país para darle un mejor futuro a mi hijo para que él creciera lejos de la delincuencia. <risa> 